Cavalcade of America. The DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry, presents Raymond Massey in Wire to the West on Cavalcade of America. And here is Raymond Massey. Good evening. Tonight, the DuPont Company brings Cavalcade of America back for its 15th year on the air. I've been here many times before in many roles. And on this opening night, I'm here in a new character, Hiram Sibley, a man whose work has touched the lives of every man and woman in America. And here's the story. It's Washington, D.C., back in the middle of the last century. Mr. Hiram Sibley of Rochester, New York, enters a sleepy little telegraph office. Anyone here? Hello? Hello? Come in. I hear you. I ain't deep. I heard you the first time. I want to send this telegram to Rochester. Oh, Rochester. Got it read out? Of course. Rochester's pretty expensive. You'd save yourself a lot of money if you send it to New York. Even Boston would be cheaper. Will you please send this to Rochester? All right, if you like. I was just advising you. Let's see now. October 4, 1849. Mrs. Elizabeth Sibley. Your wife? Yes, but why? Just curious. Mrs. Elizabeth Sibley, business successfully concluded. Leave Washington today. Arrive home Tuesday. Kiss the children. Love, Hiram. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Kissing the children is going to cost you extra. <laughs> Fees a dollar and seventy-five cents for ten words. Twenty-five cents a word thereafter. Still want to kiss them? Of course. That'll be two dollars and fifty cents. Ah, uh, there you are. Uh, when will it arrive? Well, now, sir, that is a mighty good question. A mighty fine one. When will it arrive? Well, now, let's see if we can figure that out. From Washington here to New York, well, that'll be quick. That's our own line. So let's say it'll get to New York about, oh, eight tonight. That means it'll start upstate New York tomorrow morning. Why not tonight? Oh, it ain't our line from New York to Albany. No, no, that's another line. That means it has to be took over to the other company by messenger. And messengers, they quit at seven. Starts upstate tomorrow morning... Gets to Albany, then switch to another line. Maybe it'll be on its way to Buffalo by evening. But why Buffalo? I want this sent to Rochester. Yes, but we just been informed that we ain't on talking terms with the company that's got a line into Rochester. We send to Buffalo. And there, it would probably be put in the mail. The stagecoach takes a day from Buffalo to Rochester. Oh, better say two. Um... Well... Well, I'd say it's got a pretty fair chance of arriving in Rochester early Wednesday morning. But I'll be there myself on Tuesday. Yeah, so you will. <laughs> well, wouldn't that be nice? Your wife won't have to bother going down to the telegraph office to get the message. You can pick it up yourself. One hundred years ago, the infant telegraph industry teetered on the brink of chaos. Over 50 different lines, large and small, were operating along the eastern seaboard of the country, a few even reaching timidly westward towards the Mississippi. But it was progress without pattern. Messages more often than not failed to get through. Rates were raised and lowered without reason, without warning. And that was a bare hundred years ago. I tell you, Hiram, it's a tremendous opportunity. You've just got to come in with us. Build another telegraph line. Judge Selden, seems to me the country is overstocked with telegraph lines already. And they're all of them bad. Oh, Elizabeth. Oh, Mrs. Sibley. Oh, sit down, please. You go right ahead with your talk. I'll pour the coffee. Well, Hiram, can I count you in? I don't see it, Judge. You don't? No. It seems like a ridiculous venture, at least at this time. Right after Morse invented the telegraph, every Johnny and his cousin Mary began building telegraph lines. The result is that the country is suffering from a bad case of telegraphitis. But, Hiram, the country's growing, and the telegraph will grow with it. Maybe, maybe so. 
Maybe when the men who run the telegraph industry begin to get some idea of what the public expects, what it wants, maybe then it will amount to something. Well, I must say I'm disappointed in your reaction, Hiram. That's the way I feel about it, Judge. As things stand now, I want no part of the telegraph. Well, then I suppose there's no use taking up more of your time. I'll be getting on. Oh, but you will stay and have some coffee. I'm sorry, afraid not, Mrs. Sibley. It's late. It's past my bedtime. No hard feelings, Judge. Oh, of course not. Won't change your mind, Hiram? No. Well, good night. Good night, Judge. Good night. That surprises me. The judge is usually so sound in his business judgment. But this wild scheme, telegram, I don't see it. I think I'll sit and read in the parlor for a bit, Elizabeth. Have you seen that book I was reading? Uh, the Federalist Papers? Uh-huh. Oh, I put it on your desk in the study. Is it an interesting book? Very interesting. The arguments of Hamilton and Madison and some of the other great statesmen of the time for the need of a strong national government. You wouldn't think they had to fight for the Constitution, argue for it, but they had to. They had to show that the country would never get anywhere as long as the states kept apart, each rivaling the other. They showed that the only way the country could survive was with a strong central authority. Hmm. Seems to me, Hiram, that that's just what the telegraph companies need. Hmm? Yeah? Well, isn't that right? You mean some central authority? Well, something to bring them together so they can serve the people efficiently. So they can give the country what it needs, a responsible, dependable, cheap way of sending messages across the country. Yes. Yes. Well, I'm going up to bed. Good night, dear. Good night. Let's put it this way, Judge. I changed my mind. You astonish me, Hiram. Why? Well, you seem so set in your views when we spoke together last week. <laughs> the only things I know of that never change their minds are mad dogs and politicians. <laughs> <laughs> I'm neither. I'm a businessman. I'll come in with you, Judge, but with one reservation. And that? Simply this. The main objective of our business will not be just to build another telegraph line to the Mississippi. Our goal will be to gather all of the telegraph lines in our territory under a single vigorous enterprise, one that will serve the public first, last, and always. On that basis, I'll come in. On that basis, Hiram, it's a deal. On September 6th, 1850, Hiram Sibley, Judge Samuel Selden and a group of other prominent Rochester businessmen formed the New York and Mississippi Valley Printing Telegraph Company. As soon as all the details were set, Hiram Sibley, battered old traveling bag in hand, began to wander along the highways and byways of the back country of the Middle West. He began to lay the groundwork of his dream. Hello there, blacksmith. I say hello. Hiram, are you Mr. Kittle, Hiram? Well, my name is Hiram Sibley. I'm very glad to meet you. Shoe? Got a horse to shoe? Well, bring the critter in. No, I said I was glad to meet you. I'll try for deep. Emmy, come here and find out what this fellow wants. Come in. Uh, pretty hot weather, isn't it, Mr. Kittleheim? No, ain't gonna vote for that fella. Gonna vote straight wig ticket. You be wanting something, mister? Yes, ma'am. My name is Hiram Sibley. I've been told that your husband owns some stock in the Cleveland and Cincinnati Telegraph Company. Is that right? Wished it was, but it is. What's he saying, Emmy? He ain't said nothing yet, Pa. Well, then I'll get back to work. No, no, wait. I, I'd i like to talk to you about the stock. Uh, do you have it here? Part of it. Part of it? Had a mighty fine engraving of Jackson on it. We got it framed inside. Pretty picture. You've got the stock framed? No, just the picture. Cut it out and fixed it real nice. But where's the rest of the certificate? Hmm? Let me see now. Oh, sure enough. It's patched over the leak we had in the kitchen. Mighty strong paper. Holds out the water real good. Well, what's he saying? He ain't doing any saying, Paul. I'm doing all the saying so far. Well, get to it. Get to it. Mrs. Kittleheim, I'd like to buy the stock. You're fooling. No, I'm not. I'll give you $20 for it. Paul, he said... I heard him. Ain't you deep to hear a fool offering good cash for a water patch? 
Emmy, go fetch the picture in the paper before this here sucker squirms off the hook. Well, there they are, Judge. Contracts with the Lake Erie Company, the Cleveland and Ohio Company, the Ohio Telegraph Company. <laughs> I'm tired, worn out. You've uh, done a fine job, Hiram. Only... Only what? Well, while you've been gone, we've been working on the Erie and Michigan Telegraph Company. Ezra Cornell's outfit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Any success? Very little. Uh -huh. Oh, we've managed to convince his two partners that consolidation would benefit both our lines. But old Ezra is the original lone wolf. He'll have no part of it. And without the Erie and Michigan, we're sunk. Their lines are the lines we need to really round out our system. That's right. Well, I'll be on my way. Going home, Harry? Huh? No, nope. I'm going to New York to beard a lone wolf in his den. Young man, is Mr. Ezra Cornell in? He might be, and then again, he might not. Who shall I say wants to see him? Mr. Hiram Sibley. What? What? Come again? Mr. Hiram Sibley. Mr. Hiram Sibley? Yes, please announce me. Oh, my. Oh, my, oh, my, oh, my. Is something wrong? Not yet, but when I tell Mr. Cornell that you're out here, I reckon everything's going to go wrong. You, you ain't got no weapons on you, have you? Don't be ridiculous. Well, well, all right. But don't say I ain't warned you. Mr. Hiram Sibley. Just wait till I tell that to Mr. Cornell. Our story, Wire to the West, starring Raymond Massey, will continue in just a moment. You're listening to The Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. This is Cavalcade's 15th season on the air. During that time, we've brought you stories of yesterday and today of men and women who have added their share to the building of a strong and great nation. And we brought you, too, stories about products of chemical science, products represented by the familiar trademark, the DuPont Oval. This trademark on any product is the symbol of the skill and integrity of the DuPont Company. It helps you to buy with confidence. The DuPont Oval, trademark of the DuPont Company, is your assurance of better things for better living through chemistry. Little link in the projected network of telegraph lines that'll bind the country together. And now, Hiram Sibley, I'll take the liberty of inviting you to get out of my office. Now, wait a minute. I'm grateful of the opportunity you've given me to tell you what I think of you face to face. You can call me a pirate, Cornell, a line grabber, a grip sack buccaneer. I don't care partner. what you Going call me. Going around buying up telegraph stock as if it were corn or potatoes. A fine way of doing business. I've paid spot cash for every bit of telegraph stock I've bought, and I've given a fair price for value received. You're trying to suppress competition. Cornell. I'm an old Yankee. I was nursed on competition. I think it's a fine thing when the public profits from it by low prices and better service. But that's not what is happening in the telegraph field. But now let's calm down and see this thing sensibly. Business with the Erie in Michigan is bad, isn't it? Well, it... it's bad. Uh, yes. And it's bad with our line, too. Why? Because the people can't afford to use the telegraph. Rates are too high. They're too high because costs are double all along the line. Two offices for every one we need. Two sets of lines to be repaired. Two of everything. It doesn't make sense. Are you trying to set yourself up as some sort of public benefactor, Sibley? No, I'm just a businessman. And so are you. What's good for the public is good for business. And you can turn that around. What's good for business is good for the people. Now, honestly... You believe that, too, don't you, Cornell? Um, I suppose you've figured out the financial angle. Yes, I have the figures here. I'll leave them with you. We'll get together. Sibley, we should have met before this. I might have had a different idea about you. <laughs> Quite possibly. I'm staying at the commercial hotel. Let me know when you read the contract. Uh, You'll right. find them satisfactory. Maybe. But uh, one thing. Yeah? One thing I want you to know right now. This idea may be yours. This arrangement yours. 
But if I decide to agree, which I don't say I will, but if I do decide to agree, the name of our company must be my choice. Well, what is the name, Cornell? One I've had in mind for a long time. Western Union. Western Union. I like it. By 1860, the Western Union Telegraph Company gave the people the means of instantaneous communication from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River. It was a going concern, successful, reliable, prosperous. But Hiram Sibley wasn't satisfied. He had an idea. Another idea. Pacific, Mr. Sibley? You, you're serious? You want Western Union to build a telegraph line to California? I'm deadly serious, Mr. Morris. Well, now, that's a big project. A very big project. A little too big, I should say. Mr. Sibley, now, do you expect to string a line 1,500 miles across the wilderness, across a land infested with Indians, to drag poles out there where there isn't even a tree within hundreds of miles? It won't work. Gentlemen, do I take it that the rest of you are infected with the same timidity that seems to have overcome Mr. Mann? You won't come in with me on a line to the Pacific? Very well, then. If you won't join hands with me in this, I'll go it alone. Oh, Hiram. Yes, Judge? I've always been with you, believed in you, and worked with you. But this isn't the place for personal feelings. I think these gentlemen are right. Ah. The project is much too tenuous for our company to undertake. Because if it fails, the damage to our whole enterprise would be enormous. All right, all right. Now, wait a minute. I've got a compromise. You go ahead and build the line. I'll come in with you personally, as will many of the others, I'm sure. Use Western Union men, use Western Union resources. Everything and anything you want. And when the line is finished, we'll undertake to operate. Now, what about that? Yeah. For the second time, Judge, it's a deal. <laughs> In Washington, Sibley's idea of a transcontinental telegraph line was warmly received by Congress. On June 16, 1860, an act was passed to facilitate communication between the Atlantic and Pacific states by electric telegraph. It was to be done in two years from the start of construction, if it could be done at all. In May of 1861, the line east from California was begun at Placerville. July 4th, 1861, the line west was begun from Fort Kearney, Nebraska. Reports on progress flew across the lines of Western Union to Hiram, Sibley, and Rochester. Do you have it in full, Bill? Sure, this is the all, Mr. Sibley. Let me see. Anything serious, Hiram? From Creighton, superintendent of the line going into Salt Lake City. Listen. Contractor refused to deliver poles. What? Only five days supply left. No chance to cut our own as country here is almost barren. Please advise. What are you going to do? <laughs> we've beaten our way this far. Indians haven't stopped us. Rivers haven't. Mountains, deserts, we've beaten them all. And now a lumber contractor thinks he can stop us. Well, he can't. Judge... You'll have to look after things here for a while. I don't see what good that will do. I don't either, but I'm going west. I'll get Creighton the poles he needs if I have to carry them from the Missouri to Salt Lake City on my back. Well, I'm glad to see you, Mr. Sibley, but there was no real reason for you to come out here. I've straightened things out. Then you're getting your poles, Creighton? Oh, yes, I'm getting them. Just made the final arrangements. Of course, they're costing us a lot more than we figured. Now, hold up. More or less, yes. But I decided it was best to take what we could get. You see, the contractor happens to be, uh, well, he's a rather close relative to the man who more or less does the uh, driving out here, Brigham Young. Oh, I see. Yes, I... Oh, uh, come in. Uh, excuse me. I was told that I would find Mr. Edward Creighton here. Yes, I'm Creighton. I'm Brigham Young. Uh, oh, uh, Mr. Hiram Sibley, Mr. Young. 
Mr. Sibley. How do you do, sir? Uh, Mr. Creighton, I'm told that one of my relatives entered into a contract with you to furnish poles for the telegraph. Yes, sir. Is it also true that the price agreed upon in this contract was subsequently raised? That's right, sir. Let me see those contracts, please. Right here, sir. Hmm. Mr. Creighton, tear up this contract. The poles will be furnished by my relative in accordance with the terms of the original agreement. Somebody, please shut that door so we can hear ourselves think. Folks have come from hundreds of miles around for this celebration, Mr. Creighton. Ain't nobody going to shut them up. Yes, I suppose not. <coughs> Mr. Sibley, we're all ready. Try to raise Fort Kearney. Yes, sir. Send CQ to Fort Kearney. Fort Kearney. Yes, sir. We're, we're in contact, sir. The line is through. Mr. Sibley, the line is through. Instead of the two years' limit set for the undertaking, Hiram Sibley built the first transcontinental telegraph line in less than five months. 132 days from the start of construction, a picket fence of poles stretched from west to east, clean across the continent, and was ready to send the first message scudding across its singing wire. Judge Field, the operator's ready. Will you dictate the message? Yes, thank you. To Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, the people of California desire to congratulate you upon the completion of this great work. They believe that it will be the means of strengthening the attachment which binds both the East and the West to the Union. And they desire in this the first message across the continent to express their loyalty to the Union and their determination to stand by its government on this, its day of trial. They regard the government with affection and will adhere to it under all fortunes. Stephen J. Field, Chief Justice of California. <laughs> At the moment of crisis, with the country at the brink of civil war, a thin wire helped draw the nation together, brought the Pacific to the Atlantic in the wink of a second, a flash of time. In Washington, Hiram Sibley figured the job was over. Yes, sir. Can I help you, sir? Oh, Mr. Sibley. Hello, Luther. Busy? Oh, gracious. Always busy, sir. Will you send this wire for me? Yes, sir. Can I have it? Mrs. Elizabeth Sibley, that's your wife, Rochester, New York. Business successfully concluded, leaving Washington today, arrive home Tuesday, love, Hiram. Uh, ain't you forgetting something, Mr. Sibley? How's that? Nothing here about kissing the children. You can kiss them now for just a few pennies more. <laughs> Luther, there's a time in a man's life when he stops kissing his children and they begin to kiss him. It's one of the ways a man knows when he's getting old. It's 11 years now since I sent that first message, remember? Yes, sir. Like it was yesterday. Well, if nothing else, the 11 years has saved me the expense of telegraphing kisses to my kids. Just send the wire as it is, Luther. Yes, Mr. Sibley. I hope the wire will arrive before Wednesday. Oh, it'll be in Rochester within the hour. And you can depend on that, sir. You can depend on that, Luther. You just said it. That's the greatest thing, the whole 11 years in a nutshell. The whole story of Western Union. One hundred years is not too long a span of time. And yet, in a single century, the telegraph industry has grown from nothing into a vast network that binds every village of our country with every other hamlet, town, and city. This is a monument to Hiram Sibley. It's a monument to enterprise, courage, and faith. To many men who have worked many years to make private industry serve the needs 
of all the people. Now, here's Bill Hamilton speaking for the DuPont Company. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to meet Miss Alice E. Burns of Herkimer, New York. A few weeks ago, Miss Burns bought four shares of stock in the DuPont Company. Although she didn't know it at that time, her purchase made her the 100,000th stockholder. But maybe I'd better let her tell you the story. Miss Burns? Well, Mr. Hamilton, I knew something about DuPont through its connection with Remington Arms at Ilion, New York, where I teach school. My friends who work at Remington speak very highly of DuPont. And when DuPont announced that its stock was being split, I had a little money left over, so I decided to buy some shares. Miss Burns, just how did you go about buying the stock? You know, a lot of people don't know how to do it. Oh, I just went into a broker's office in Utica, told them I wanted to buy some DuPont stock. They took care of the rest. Well, that wasn't much of a problem, was it? It might surprise you to know that over half of the DuPont stockholders are women. They have a very important place in business today as investors who have loaned their money so that industry has new capital with which to expand. By the way, Miss Burns, I understand you've just finished a trip to the DuPont offices and research laboratories at Wilmington, several manufacturing plants, and also the DuPont Atlantic City exhibit. What do you think of your company now that you're an owner? Well, one of the things, Mr. Hamilton, that impressed me the most was the fact that DuPont people seem so interested and proud of their work. The executives of the company, the research people, and the men and women in the plants were all very friendly. I found this true wherever I visited. You're certainly right, Miss Burns, and it couldn't happen anywhere else but in America. Tell me, what did you learn about research? Research? Well, I remember one thing. Someone told me that over half of DuPont's sales today are in products that have come into being in the last 20 years. Somehow that surprised me for a company almost 150 years old. Yes. Thousands of small businesses and at least hundreds of thousands of jobs have been created because of new products of DuPont Research. I guess that's what you mean when you give the DuPont slogan, Better Things for Better Living, through chemistry. It certainly is one of the things that the slogan stands for. DuPont men and women working together to create and produce new products have helped bring better living to America. Thank you, Miss Burns, for being our special guest on Cavalcade tonight. <laughs> Tonight's cavalcade play, Wire to the West, was written by Irv Tunick. Appearing with Mr. Massey were Cameron Prudhomme as Judge Selden, Parker Fenley as the operator. The music for the DuPont cavalcades, composed by Arden Cornwell, conducted by Donald Vorey. Your narrator, Ted Pearson. Next week, Cavalcade will present the gifted Hollywood star, Paul Henry, in Lay That Musket Down, an exciting story of revolutionary times. Be sure to join us next week for Cavalcade and our star, Paul Henry. Cavalcade of America, directed by John Zoller, came to you this evening from the stage of the Vanderbilt Theater in New York and is presented by the DuPont Company, Wilmington, Delaware, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. <laughs> this is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Thank mm -hmm. you.